Welcome to Talking with Tatchell. We've had a Labour government for a decade now, but many trade unionists are far from happy. They say that Labour has failed to deliver on its pledges to repeal Tory anti-trade union laws and to advance the interests and welfare of working people. We are seeing right now an unprecedented attempt to part privatise health and education, something that not even the Conservatives contemplated. We're also seeing uh, a round of pay restraint in the public sector where Gordon Brown is imposing below inflation levels of wage increases, effectively a pay cut for millions of workers. And of course, under the uh, European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, we've seen the government seek an opt-out when it comes to employees' protections in the workplace. So in all these different ways, trade unionists, ordinary working class people, have not, in many people's eyes, got a decent deal. With me to discuss the future of trade unionism and relations with the Labour government is Brendan Barber, the General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress. Welcome, Brendan. Thank you, Peter. I mean, obviously, for rank-and-file trade unions, there does seem to be a real problem here between you know, what trade unions feel they need for their members and what the Labour government is delivering. What's your take on that? Well, in your introduction, you've outlined some of the areas where there certainly are real problems and a real sense uh, of grievance. And I'm, I'm very happy to talk about those. But just to slightly balance it by reflecting some of the positives. I mean, this is a government that has put full employment right at the centre of its priorities, right from the start of those 10 years. Uh, and I can think back uh, 15, 20 years ago when we in the trade union movement were running campaigns for full employment and we were told it was a pipe dream, it simply wasn't achievable. Well, the government has made some real progress and that's hugely important. And just in terms of the public services debate, we have real criticisms and, and let's talk about those. But we are operating in a context in which we have seen sustained investment in the public services. Uh, and that's a very, very different scenario to the long period of previous Conservative government when we saw the public services progressively run down. So we've got problems, we've got arguments about the extent to which they look to private sector so solutions sometimes uh, when they want to, to see, uh, talk about reforms in the public services. But the, the overall context is one in which there is a commitment to public service and that's hugely important to ordinary working people. On the issue of you know, the existing you know, pay restraint that's being imposed by Gordon Brown, do you want to explain what, what it's actually going to mean for millions of public sector workers? Well, I think this is, has been a major, major mistake uh, by government. The government is concerned. They don't want to see inflation getting out of control. We all understand that. But the target they seem to have chosen to try to uh, restrain any inflationary pressures is the pay of public servants. And I just don't think that's justified. I don't think the evidence supports that. When the governor of the Bank of England had to write to the chancellor uh, when inflation went outside the target uh, level, that's regarded as, uh, as appropriate and that the governor of the bank has to, has to formally write to the chancellor. Uh, he didn't cite pay pressures as leading to the increase in inflation. He pointed to the problems of energy prices and to some extent food prices uh, zooming ahead much faster than predicted. So I don't think the government targeting public sector pay has been justified by the economics and the consequences of it uh, as you said in your introduction, has been that millions of people in our health service, in local government, in our other major public services are being expected to, to put up with a real decrease in their living standards uh, because their pay simply isn't matching up to inflation. And that's not an acceptable approach. I mean, it does seem very unfair when we hear, keep on hearing stories about the fat cat bosses in the city getting that £14 billion in, in bonuses recently. I mean, it just seems that the government is, has lost sight of its core constituency. The trade unions formed the Labour Party, yet, you know, under, under Labour, you know, 
the economy is, is, is doing very well, agreed, but the benefits are being reaped by a very small number to the exclusion of the great mass of people who create the wealth of this country. Yes, I mean, that big picture of growing inequality, not just between the extremes, those right at the top and those right at the bottom, but between those right at the top and, and the great majority of people in the middle somewhere, uh, but where we see this super rich elite um, accumulating wealth beyond the dreams of, of avarice at a time when an awful lot of people are being told, uh, hold your horses, you, you're not even going to get a, a pay rise that matches inflation. Uh, I think that is a bigger uh, challenge and a challenge that we need to see the government responding to. I sense, I sense that there's a real worry about this super rich floating free of the rest of society, um, not paying their share, uh, fair share of tax to help support uh, our major public services, uh, and increasingly isolated. And I don't think that's healthy in a democracy. I mean, do you think the contract, the agreement between the government and the unions can be sustained? Because some unions are already talking about the possibility of industrial action. Well, we have seen disputes in some parts of the public services, uh, and there may yet be uh, there may yet be more. That's you know that's there for all to see. Um, I hope they've learned a lesson this year that this very arbitrary approach of a centrally dictated, very crude uh, public service pay target, uh, which was established at two percent then ruthlessly forced through without giving a real opportunity for proper negotiation. Uh, and this year, with the government not supporting the recommendations of the independent pay review bodies in key areas, that in particular has generated uh, much of the anger when the, for health service staff, there's a review body that makes a recommendation. They recommended 2.5%, already below inflation, and the government insisted on scaling it down even further by staging the awards. I hope the government have learnt this year quite how unacceptable that approach is regarded as being, and I hope we're not going to see that in future pay rounds. Do you think that learning it in the future may not be enough? Because I can speak for my, my own trade union colleagues. People are seething. You know, people feel real resentment that, as you say, middle and low income people are being, you know, have, having, their, having their pay increases suppressed while you know a very small minority of very very rich people uh, are having soar away incomes I mean it, it just isn't fair and I, I, I get the sense that a lot of trade unionists think that labor has to be taught a lesson there has to be some kind of industrial action to show that the unions are not going to be kicked around anymore well we've seen industrial action in a number of areas mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I want the government to reflect because of the electoral consequences of these decisions uh, for themselves in government. I mean, an awful lot of public service, public servants are deeply disaffected by these, these decisions. Uh, the government will pay an electoral price out of that disaffection uh, if they're seen to try and persist uh, with these policies. Uh, I mean, one of the ironies is, as I say, the overall context is that there has been a lot of extra investment in the major public services. And yet instead of the people who work in our health service, for example, being out there as ambassadors for that extra investment, telling their friends and neighbours how things are improving because of that extra investment, instead of that, they're fed up and demoralised because of the way change is being managed and because of, in particular, this year, the approach to their pay. Um, the government will be paying an electoral price for these decisions and I think it's in their own self-interest to think pretty carefully uh, for the future. Could we end up with a winter of discontent? Well, uh, people always look back to the winter of discontent and it is one of those kind of very important periods in our history. Um, I don't think we're looking at that. I mean, the, in the, the so-called winter of discontent, uh, almost half the economy seemed to be affected by industrial, major industri industrial disputes. Um, so, no, we're not uh, looking at, I think, the prospects of that kind of real breakdown in relations between unions and government that occurred in 78, 79. But these are serious tensions, that is for sure. Um, there are serious political consequences. 
Uh, and there are serious consequences for millions of people that deserve better treatment than this. On the issue of the European Union um, Charter of Fundamental Rights, there's a whole range of protections there which are designed to ensure a fairer and more just society, to protect people in the workplace, which the government wants to opt out of. Do you want to explain a bit about what those opt-outs are and, and what the consequences are in terms of workers' rights? Well, just a, a little bit of history, so to speak. Um, the trade union movement was very sceptical about the potential benefits of the European Union. But back towards the end of the 1980s, our view changed, in particular at the time when Jacques Delors led the European Commission. And he had a strong vision that as a part of Europe going forward, there needed to be a strong social dimension, a real priority given to a, a solid platform of rights for workers uh, and for citizens, so that this was not just seen as a growing common market or European Union for the bankers and the businessmen, this was uh, a European Union that had potential benefits for all the citizens of Europe. Now what we've been concerned about in the TUC is that that overarching vision has been getting diluted and that in particular our government, the British government, a Labour government, has not been supporting some of the important employment measures that the European Union has wanted to introduce. Can you give me some examples? Well, one major example, a key area for us, is that there's been a proposal for a, a European directive to protect the position of people who work through employment agencies to try and ensure that they are treated on the same basis as other workers doing similar jobs. And that that directive has not yet made progress, and in part, because our government has not been supporting it. Now, um, insofar as there is this impression of a lack of support for the social dimension of the European Union, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights is one manifestation of that. I mean, this is a charter that articulates some basic rights that are expected to be commonly observed throughout all the member states of the European Union. It is only our government, one uh, the only member state that is saying we don't want this charter to have legal force, to have full legal force. So that signal that's being sent is a very, very negative signal. And we've pressed the government strongly. Uh, think, think again. For the European Union to maintain the support of ordinary people, they have to see that there is a real commitment to decent standards for workers. Uh, as a part of the vision going forward. It does seem very shocking that, you know, that we're not talking about extremist demands, we're talking about very, very moderate proposals which are agreed even by right-wing parties in other parts of Europe. You know, you know Christian Democrats and others yeah. are, are supporting them, but our Labour government won't. Well, the irony is that, that the government would say that all the key elements of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, they are already being honoured in Britain for example, through our adoption of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is reflected in our Human Rights Act. Uh, much of the issues covered by that human rights legislation is reflected in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But what they say they're concerned about is that a European, the European Court of Justice might at some point in the future interpret some, uh, our legislation on some of these issues in a way that the government would not be comfortable with and they don't want to allow that possibility of the European Court making such a judgment. In other words, a, a judgment in favour of working people. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's an extraordinary position that we've got, that a Labour government adopts that stance. I mean, the, we see the same on, on privatisation. I think, you know, many of us who were for years and years and decades in the Labour Party are astonished that a Labour government is now in, engaged in a creeping privatisation of of its great achievements, the health service and education. And, you know, this is not even something that Margaret Thatcher contemplated. And, you know, we see with the private finance initiative the knock-on effect. Um, in Oxfordshire, where I'm standing as a Green Party candidate, we're seeing that the local um, health uh, authorities are going to shortly have to stump up, you know, £30 million in payback under the private finance initiative. And that's going to have to come out of provision for core services. So, I mean, where do you, 
wh wh where do you stand? And how, how, how can the trade unions you know, tolerate what, what, what Labour is doing? Well, I don't think we have been supporting those changes in any shape or yeah, form. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean and, you were supporting yeah, them, but, no, but I mean, indeed, you know... Indeed. And uh, I would like to think that there are the first signs that there may be some rethinking now taking place in government. Uh, I think since uh, the change in the premiership and obviously a major government reshuffle, we've got new ministers in all the departments. Certainly in the Department of Health, for example, Alan Johnson has now, I think, been trying to send signals that there are limits to how far the private sector should be involved, that there are limits to the way in which arbitrary targets have just been laid down and imposed centrally which trusts are then chase their tails trying to keep up with in a way that's not been in the interests of, uh, of patients. Um, and there's a new commitment to trying to work with the unions who represent health service staff to, to use their expertise and all the insights they're able to bring to bear to help think through the best way of making changes that will lead to real improvements in the health service uh, rather, than, uh, rather than what we've been seeing. So um, I don't want to be over-optimistic, but I would like to think that there is some rethinking now beginning to take place. I certainly hope that's the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, uh, Sir Digby Jones was head of the CBI, Confederation of British Industry, a notorious union basher. How did you feel when he was appointed by Gordon Brown as a minister? Well, I thought it was a curious uh, appointment. Um, but I wasn't over over concerned with it. Uh, I was a little bit more concerned, really, about the the sense that in the reshuffling of government that took place, including um, the DTI changed its name and became the Department for Business Enterprise and Regulatory Reform, that in the context of that change there was much less emphasis in the remit of that new department on looking after the interests of working people and recognising that as a part of the balance in this enterprise society of ours, a part of the balance needs to be decent, solid protections to ensure that people don't face exploitation in the way that too often they, they do today. But, so but, you I, know, I, I'm astonished that a Labour government would appoint an anti-union business leader rather than a trade unionist with, with professional expertise and you know, the ability to do the job. There are plenty of trade union people like yourself who've got great competence, great intelligence, great expertise, oh, great talent. <laughs> uh, and and, and yeah. why aren't people like you being appointed as ministers? Well, I'm not, I'm not looking for a no, no, job. No, I don't mean, I don't mean, you, looking, I don't no, mean no, you personally. I'm not but, looking but, for but, a job from Gordon. But you, you, get, you get my sense. I mean, I just feel yeah, that, I, I do. that the partnership I between do. the trade and unions I, and Labour is very lopsided. And I do think, I mean, I think what the government would say, and of course they're right, is that there are a lot of people in the Labour Party, including in the ministerial ranks of the government, with very extensive trade union experience and with a very good, close working relationship with unions. So it would be wrong to, to think that somehow we need to get somebody appointed to a job for there to be a proper relationship with unions. Uh, but I thought, I thought it was a bit disappointing, certainly, that in what was described as a government of all the talents, there wasn't somewhere within that some recognition that a part of the talents and a part of the experience that needs to be built into uh, the work the government do is perhaps experience in the trade union world, representing ordinary working people. This sort of brings me to sort of the, the issue about the future agenda of trade unionism. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, to me, trade unions are some of the most important institutions in our society. Their campaigns have produced phenomenal improvements in the quality of life for ordinary people. Not just wages and working conditions, but health and safety, pensions, yeah. the whole range of issues. Without trade unions, millions and millions of people in this country would be far, far worse off. And it's time that that contribution was properly recognised and, and, and valued. Um, as I said, you know, the government's treatment of the trade unions doesn't seem to recognise it. But I just wonder whether also the trade unions need to up the ante, so to speak, in the sense of not just operating as merely defensive organisations, protecting their members against you know, pay cuts or job losses, but also setting an agenda for 
economic and social change. Now, I know the trade unions do lots of work in those areas, but particularly in the workplace, you talked yeah. about the talents. You know, in every workplace, there are people there working who have accumulated decades of experience and knowledge about their jobs, yet they don't have any input, in most cases, into decision making. They're not on the boards, they're not asked for their viewpoint, for their perspective. They're not given any power. They've got no investment in, in that institution. Isn't the whole issue of industrial democracy, you know, an economic democracy to parallel political democracy, something that the trade unions ought to be pushing? I, I think it is. I mean, trade unionism is about giving people a voice at work. That's absolutely central uh, to what we do. And one of our failures, I think, in a sense, is that we haven't got across the extent to which we have contributed to building some of Britain's best businesses. The most successful organisations, uh, are, in many cases, are those that have worked sensibly, constructively with unions, have recognised that having a legitimate, independent voice for their workforce and taking that genuinely into account in the way they run their businesses actually is a plus. That's not a drag on well-run organisations. That's a real asset. Mm. Well, I can think of a number of, uh, of our major banks, for example, um, who've just in the, in the last couple of months, I've been at occasions with a couple of our biggest banks that have both um, either just d developed their agreement with the unions in a new way that they're positively celebrating, uh, celebrating the relationship in different ways that would say that the union contribution has been absolutely central to their success. I can think of other organisations in, in other parts of, of the economy. And yet, um, of course, we are about tackling injustice and exploitation. People facing the worst treatment, facing the worst employers, but we're also a part of the recipe for building successful organisations. And uh, we need to do more to get that message across and indeed to persuade some of those employers to speak out about the benefits they recognise they get from having a, a, a sturdy union contribution to their organisations. When I look at the political system, I see that thanks to the levellers, the charters, the suffragettes, we've got one person, one vote. But when it comes to the economy, it's an economic dictatorship. All the votes are held by the major shareholders, the directors and the managers. The millions of people who work in the enterprises have got no votes at all. Now surely, you know, to me, social justice is about extending democracy into the economic realm so that people who contribute in whatever way to the enterprise and its success have a say and that their talent, their experience, their accumulated knowledge is inputted to make those enterprises more productive. That would seem to be both a fairer and more just system, a more democratic and open system, and also the way to a more successful productive economy. Well, I, I agree, and that's absolutely, in the best run organisations, that's really the way that you see it working, with the union contribution properly recognised uh, by the employers. I mean, we have legislation now in place, since Labour came to office, that supports trade union recognition, where a majority of the workforce have indicated support for it, and that was an important move forward. But, but what about the idea of having trade union or worker representatives mandatory on the board? You know, well, to have places on the board so they have full access to the whole company information, there's a right to know, and they can also directly input and influence decision making. Why not? Well, if, if it's a partnership sure, between capital sure. and labour, let's have a partnership. Well, that, that, that debate about that kind of reform We've not really had a, a lively debate about that for a long period in, in this country. There was a period 20 or 30 years ago when there was a pretty vibrant debate about industrial democracy and uh, indeed there was a commission that, that looked at that kind of, uh, of reform. Um, uh, unions were always a bit ambivalent about it, just to say. There was a feeling that, that it, if, depending how the structures were devised, this could result in unions being expected to accept an awful lot of responsibility for decisions over which they wouldn't really be able to exert a decisive uh, influence and that that would potentially compromise an independent union role. But I think, I think you're right that without getting locked into a precise formula, 
the issue of genuine opportunities for workforce involvement. Uh, we need a much livelier debate about that than perhaps we've had for some time. Yeah, I, I was going to my local hospital the other week and I was chatting to some of the nurses there and I was complaining about the system and they said, we know, we've worked here. One woman, she'd worked in a hospital for St Thomas's for 25 years. She said, we know about this problem. We've been saying it for years, yeah. but we've got no influence. Yeah. We, yeah. we, you know, this, this is all, it's all NHS consultants and managers to solve this. We, the ordinary workers, haven't got any input. I thought to myself, if only you had some input, then perhaps this long-standing problem would have been solved. It, it, it seems right. common sense. I agree. Dead right. So what are we going to do about getting the trade unions to lead a serious campaign to ensure that we have a parallel economic democracy alongside our political democracy? Well, I think we are pressing that issue and that cause. Um, I mean, there are different circumstances in the public sector to the private sector, for example. Our biggest challenge in some ways in the private sector, more, more so than the public sector, is that we need to see a much stronger level of trade union membership. Um, we have around six and a half million members in Britain's unions today. Uh, we have a much higher level of trade union density, though, in the public sector, in the private sector, is 20% or less. So I want to see, yes, a debate about different kinds of approaches to giving workers a real voice at work. Uh, but the starting point for that has got to be in an awful lot of workplaces, getting basic trade union membership uh, established. And that's a key challenge for our unions to, to you know, develop new ways of reaching out to people, getting the union message across to people, bringing people into our organizations. Well, I think, you know, perhaps if, if the unions continue all their good work on social issues, on workplace issues, and then raise the standard in terms of economic democracy and empowerment in the workplace, then perhaps more people might feel that trade unions have something really special and unique to offer, that their involvement in trade unions really can make a difference for them, their families, and our wider society. But I guess that's a debate we'll be going on for a long time to come, and hopefully, in the not-too-distant future, we might get some results. In union workplaces, you get fairer pay, safer workplaces, more investment in your training and skills. Union workplaces work better. Thank you, Brendan. I second that. And thank you all for joining us. Please join me next week for another edition of Talking with Tatchell.